it's good to have you, Justin. Why don't you tell our the millions, as The Rock would say, the millions and millions of Smoothies with Rufus fans out there, <laughs> what you do. So uh, my name is Justin Moore. I'm a uh, education coordinator and professional development manager for a company called Parabolic Performance and Rehab. Uh, I'm also a coach, so I spend about half my time doing private training, um, one-on-one, semi-privates, a little bit of group work um, in person. And then we also still have the virtual side that we do since COVID. Uh, but the other half of my job is to essentially just continue to push the envelope on professional development for the coaches at Parabolic. So we hold bi-weekly meetings um, where I present information. We use case studies. Um, we go over, you know, whatever problems, especially the younger coaches that we hire, um, to continue to bring them along as we go. So about half my week is spent teaching. Um, and then along with that, all the research that's needed to continue to grow and get better. Um, always, you know, keeping up with what Bill's doing, keeping up with what people in the, the industry who I look up to, who I've learned a great deal from are doing. Um, and then applying that to my model and continuing to build what I do. And then trying to pass that on to the, the coaches that we work with. So I have that end. And then I also have the coaching end where I'm working with everybody from, you know, I have a couple professional athletes right now, guys in the NFL, guys trying to get back in the NFL, um, all the way through young hockey players and young athletes who are, you know, just looking to train and, and get better at their sport. And then general population adults who are looking to lose weight, get in shape, feel better. Um, and I tend to work with physical therapy quite a bit and integrate with them. So I tend to work with adults who are either coming out of PT or they have a history of pain or they're still in pain, but they know they need to train or they want to train. Um, and so I have, you know, kind of an integration with our physical therapy because parabolic is kind of PT and performance. Um, and that's what attracted to me, you know, it to me at the beginning. I wanted to be part of an organization where PT and performance were integrated and I thought they did that really well. Um, and so that's where I've been for about six years now. I started out as an intern and I progressed my way up through part-time coach, um, working with our combine program to a full-time coach. And then finally to kind of the arm where I'm working as a you know, professional development coordinator along with the, the coaching end of what I do. So I wear a number of different hats, but i um, really passionate about education. Um, I love to teach. I love to give back. That was kind of how I got into this. Uh, I, I don't have a background in, uh, in you know, any sort of kinesiology or uh, science kind of realm from you know, uh, school. I basically was a communications uh, major with an undergrad in, um, I mean, uh, not an undergrad, a, uh, uh, like a secondary study in journalism and, and things like that. And then I ended up going for sports administration for my master's. Uh, but I fell in love with training along the way. And I fell in love with helping people in a way that I wasn't helped as an athlete. And so I did an internship at Seton Hall, I ended up at Parabolic. Um, and that kind of drove me to continue to teach because along the way, I had a lot of great mentors. I had a lot of people who were willing to give their time, their information to, to kind of help me along. And so that's something I'm really passionate about going forward is teaching young coaches and giving them um, kind of guidance more than anything. You know, I try to like help them along the way so that they don't make the same, mistake, the same mistakes that I did and their learning can be, you know, a little bit more expedited. Um, so that's kind of what I do. What sports did you play? I was a football player. Um, as a kid, I played a little bit of everything. So I played, I was telling somebody this the other day, I played soccer up until high school. Um, never played football at all, but I started going up for headers and I was about three times the size of anybody I was playing with. So they were getting knocked over and I was getting yellow cards. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to go play a sport where they encourage me to hit people. So... <laughs> So I ended up playing football in high school. Um, I played baseball. I played lacrosse for a year. Um, I wrestled. I played basketball a little bit, just, you know, recreationally as a kid. And then when I got to high school, like I kind of found, especially by junior year, football was, was where my, you know, my passion was and my, uh, where I could maximize my ability. And then I played in college at the division three level as well. Um, so I kind of have a football background and, and that's, you know, where I came from, but now I've kind of diversified where I work with everybody from, you know, figure skaters is kind of one end of the spectrum all the way through uh, an NFL tight end at, at seemingly the other end of the spectrum. <laughs> well, uh, when I first started going to IFAST, they had a, had a speed skater. He was, uh, he was like 13 or something. I forget the exact age. And that's close I ever came to skating. <laughs> I, did see, I did see Paolo Ono one time at the, at the uh, Olympic Training Center. 
we used to go out, we used to go out on the ice with them because we were trying to, you know, get to understand their sport better. And so we had a couple of coaches who would go out there. I'll never forget one of them went out there with a, a sleeveless cut off tee. He was about my size. He was like six, one, two thirty, muscle guy out there skating with the, the little figure skaters. It was the funniest <laughs> thing I've ever seen. <laughs> he literally looked like a fish out of water, but it's, it taught me a lot. Learn like working with those skaters taught me a lot about coaching and training. Uh, because it was the total opposite of anything I'd ever done before. Wow. That's, that's awesome. How, yeah. how young are the kids you work with? So I have, uh, I think the youngest one right now is 10. So go down to 10 and then, you know, all the way through. I have an 11 year old. I have a couple 13 year olds. I think I have a 14 year old. So kind of in that general bracket, I've worked with as young as eight. Um, we tend to have more of those youth groups when we do work with those. And I haven't worked with some of the youth groups in a while, but we go down to eight, but most of our population is going to kind of be in that early to mid teen range for the kids. What, and so with the youth groups, what kinds of things do you do with them? So when we're training kids, it's really about games. It's about open play. It's about putting them in situations where we're trying to get them to uh, kind of express different movement solutions to, to problems that we put in front of them um, to get things out of them so that they enjoy coming to us and they enjoy like physical exercise and training, but we're exposing them to as many different uh, movement competencies as possible. Like I always say, like when I'm working with kids, I'm trying to overload variability. I'm trying to overload variety. I'm trying to overload coordination more than anything else. I'm not trying to overload them with volume or intensity or anything like that. So I'm trying to get them to move their body through space in as many different ways as possible and control that as they go. So all kinds of tag games, chase games, um, open play where, you know, we'll like kind of last man standing is always a favorite. Like we'll put them into like a, a circle or, or a certain kind of confined space. Everybody gets a flag, last person with their flag wins and we'll put certain constraints on it. So we'll say like, you can only use your left hand or one of your arms has to be behind your back or you can only move in this certain way. And so it becomes a game for them. They don't even realize that they're shuffling, they're cutting, they're crossover running, they're sprinting, right? Um, so we do a lot of that, especially with the younger population. We'll use things like obstacle courses. So we'll set up different things where it's like you have to, you know, we'll bring out a bunch of FMS kits or foam rollers or hurdles and you have to crawl, jump, roll, climb over and under them. Um, we'll even do different group oriented tasks where it's like, okay, you have this certain amount of equipment. You have to get from here, from one side of the turf to the other side of the turf without ever actually touching the turf go. And so they have to figure out how to like yeah, use each other and use the equipment that we give them, whether it's Airx pads or whatever it is. Um, and they got to figure out how to get that stuff from one side to the other without touching the turf. Um, and so again, like it gets them interacting, socializing and, and going through there. And then as they get older to where the kids are, you know, 12 to 13 and even a little older, I'll still keep that in because I think that's really important where they're getting to uh, work on change of direction work where I'm getting some sort of movement output that I desire from a multi-directional speed perspective, but I'm getting it without me having to like really coach or teach exactly what I'm looking for. But well, then we'll start to add in a little bit more of like general strength training. I definitely want all my kids to be able to go through different body weight exercises. So whether it's a, you know, a good fundamental squat to a med ball or to a box, right. Um, or push ups or some sort of body weight row, um, we'll do different like basic you know, plank exercises and we'll push and pull sled. So we'll do things like that to, to generally increase their physical capacity from a uh, force production standpoint relative to their own body mass. But most of the stuff that we do with them is going to be very game based. It's going to be very uh, more open based or open skills where we're kind of driving the multi-directional speed components that we want, but we're doing it without saying like, here's a, you know, a change of direction drill. Here's a shuffle drill. Here's a lateral run drill, whatever it is. Um, so that's kind of the overview of what we do with the kids. So Justin, go ahead, Rufus. Oh, I, I just got one, one last question. So you <laughs> When, when they see the kids playing tag and stuff, do you ever get any blowback from the parents? Yeah, yeah, we do, for sure. There's <laughs> there's elements of that. And I, I'll never forget. So one of my mentors was named John Hudak. He um, he mentored under Lee, uh, and he actually played under Lee for a little while. And so he was a big kind of guy who exposed me to Lee Tap's work very early on. So I, I had really good mentors who helped me there. But I remember one time he did a session with a softball team. 
and I got to I got to observe the session. It was awesome. It was a great session. Um, but it was young softball athletes, and he's doing chase games. He's doing tag. They're working some closed drills in between their open drills, but it's a lot of open free play, general athletic development. And afterwards, one of the parents came up and was like, "Yeah, this is great, but like, how is this different from gym class?" And I was, <laughs> it's like, I mean, these are like twelve year old softball girls, and I'm like, ah, oh, like. And he was like, listen, you just, this is what you have to deal with sometimes, but you have to have, be able to explain it to them in a context that matters to them. And that's what I always tell the coaches. It's like, you have to give people some of what they want and some of what they need. And so when I'm working with a group or with an athlete, and I know that, you know, I, I get the, the experience with the parent where they say, Hey, like, I, you know, I need my kid to do a little more of this, this, and this, or maybe like, why are they playing tag or something along those lines? you know, I'll make sure that we include some of what they would perceive as the training that they're paying for. Because we are in the private sector, right? And, and we are kind of um, in a sales business, right? So they're, they're paying us for the service. So I include that, but then I'll pull them out of the open drill and I'll do something that's like a closed drill that's more technically oriented to work on whether it's a plant foot contact or like, you know, foot outside of their base of support, trunk stiffness or linear acceleration mechanics, whatever it is, that they need to do. And then I'll put them back in the tag game. So I'll be able to say, Hey, listen, this is kind of the way that we develop uh, multi-directional speed skills in young athletes, right? We try to see in the open reactive environment first, what they're capable of doing and what their limitations are. And then we'll pull them out and then we'll work on their specific technical needs. So really we try to individualize training that way, but then we put them back in the open drill because that allows them to express it in something that's way more realistic to sport context, because now they're having to react to different stimuli. They're having to chase another athlete and they're having to compete. Um, so I try to explain that to them in, in a way that, again, speaks to their experience and their expectations of the gym, but we definitely will get some blowback there. Um, and that's, that's something that over the years, I've just had to get better at being able to not only speak to the parents about, but then also balance the program so that they're, the kids are getting some of that because I know that's what they need, right? That's what they need from a long-term development standpoint. That's what they need from an enjoyment standpoint, a physical education, um, which they just don't get enough of anymore. But at the same time, I also understand that there's certain expectations from the parents. And so within the realms of you know, what I value, I'm not obviously going to say like, well, you know, I want my kid to get stronger, so we're going to back squat a 10-year-old. Um, that that would be like where I would say like, no, that that's the line. I'm not going to do that. But within the realm of what I value, you know, I can give them a little bit of what they want as well paired with what they need. And so I think that kind of finds a little bit of a better balance for everybody. Thanks for the podcast. That was great stuff. <laughs> <laughs> All right. See you guys later. <laughs> hey, Justin, with these younger kids, do you have – certain key performance indicators and metrics you're tracking with them and does that change as they mature and kind of go I get more and more and deeper into the training process yeah I, I think it definitely does um, from a key performance indicator standpoint it's I would say it's very subjective um, but it is some of our fundamental tasks of movement so like I want to see a young kid be able to squat and like squat at a decently uh, in a quality position somewhat in a phone booth this Ty would say right like I want to see them be able to sit down there's no real reason why a young kid shouldn't spend some time in a squat and be able to have a good excursion of range of motion through that and then I want to see them to like control it so we'll have like even very young kids we'll give them like a big four pound med ball so it's like a big offset to their center of gravity and it's very light right it's like four pounds and for young young kids we'll even just give them like a big uh, stability ball to hug and then we'll have them sit to another med ball and I want to see them be able to kind of go straight down tap the med ball and push right back up or I want to see them take a body weight squat and be able to sit all the way down I want to see them be able to do a lateral lunge and be able to actually load their hip while keeping their uh, hip knee and foot on railroad tracks I want to see them perform a good split squat right a good lunge through different uh, planes of motion forward backward side to side um, I want to see them do a good push-up I want to see them do a quality row I want to see them demonstrate to me that they have an understanding of how to manage their body in something like a plank, right? So that they have an understanding of like, you know, where their belly is, if I'm talking to them, right? I've, obviously I'm thinking rib cage, I'm thinking pelvis, I'm thinking of these things, but for them, it's like, do they have any idea how to control that proximal area of their body? 
Because to me, that sets the foundation, whether it's a TRX row, a push up, a lunge. Um, I think a lot of times we do not give enough credit to um, that process as a young kid. So we'll say like, well, they're young kids. They just need to train. Like we shouldn't be coaching them through, you know, proximal stability or worrying about rib cage and pelvis. But obviously we're not using those words, but I've seen, you know, a young kid who they're already touting. One of my clients is being touted as like, you know, a really high level throwing athlete, right? He's a quarterback, uh, but he's 11, right? And his dad, his dad is all for the long-term development thing, right? But they're, they're pretty happy about his arm. <laughs> The thing is, when I watch him lunge or watch him squat, he's already kind of like his structure is already becoming somewhat cemented, right? He's a wider individual. Um, he has a certain shape to him. He's rather long for his age. Um, he's a little bit on the heavier side relative to what, what I think the expectations would be at his age. So when he lunges, it literally looks like his thorax is being tilted over backwards, right? Belly's hanging out. You know, and a couple of times he would say like, hey, I was doing lunges the other day and like my back knee kind of didn't feel good. Right. And he's 11. Right. And he can't sit into a decent squat too often. So like we work on that on a regular basis. And then when I have him go into, you know, a bear hold or a plank or something like that, I'm definitely cueing an understanding of where this region is in space and being able to control that. And I think that's super valuable. So that's a KPI. Um, and then from like a jump landing perspective, like I want to see an athlete be able to jump and show me a good bilateral landing, a good unilateral landing, and be able to do it in as many different contexts as possible. So I'm not throwing them on the jump mat and saying like, I need a lot of height or I need a good RSI, but I want to see like, can you do a height in? Can you do a leap? Can you do a hop? Can you do it in multiple, multiple directions? Can you show me pogos where you're getting off the ground quick and bouncing, but then sticking a landing as you come down, Right. Can you drop into a split stance and show me that that split squat that we work on in different contexts, you can do it fast now. So for me, it's about figuring out what are my fundamental movement competencies and then how can I get you to express those movement competencies in as many different contexts as possible because that shows me from a motor learning standpoint that that's kind of being cemented, right? It's, it's robust. Um, and for me, that's what sets a young athlete up for like long-term success. If you can do those things, then later on down the line, we can superimpose volume, intensity, speed, all of that stuff on top of it. That's, Justin, that's, can you get, so go ahead, I'm sorry. Can you get into a little bit of why developing these more traditional weight room competencies are important in terms of setting a foundation to help that carry over once they start doing more dynamic movements and things that are gonna be more similar to what they have to do on the field or court or whatever their activities are? Yeah. Yeah. I think especially with the squat and with, with anything for real, like I think Bill's model has been incredibly valuable for helping me see the, the kind of the correlation and the similarity between all of these things, right? Because it shows you that we really only have certain movement strategies for being able to express movement, right? Like gait is kind of the center of everything we do express, uh, you know, expansion and compression is kind of the, the way that we can you know, strategize movement on earth against gravity. So for me, it's like if a young kid can squat and can show me like a full movement competency, that's demonstrating the ability to dorsiflex the ankle. That's showing me knee flexion and hip flexion. That's showing me the ability to orient and control orientation of the rib cage and pelvis in space to change levels, right? And then over time, if they can do that with different constraints, again, like sometimes maybe we'll give them a med ball to hug. Sometimes they'll reach a ball out in front of them. Sometimes they'll go to a box. Sometimes they'll go free and they'll have to pause in the bottom. So I love using like tempos and pauses with young kids. Cause again, like it provides variety. So now they're like having to figure out a different solution to this movement problem. But at the same time, it's getting them to control these ranges of motion. So if you can eccentrically orient and concentrically orient your pelvic diaphragm, if you can express expansion throughout the system, then you can change levels effectively and now we can start to superimpose load on top of that to increase force production, right? Or to increase uh, the ability to resist fatigue or the ability to uh, maximize concentric orientation of a pelvic diaphragm if you need that for performance later on in terms of like jump height or getting out of a cut. So if you have that fundamental movement competency and you can then do that in something like a split squat or a lateral lunge, right? That shows me that you have early, mid, and late propulsive capabilities available to you. That shows me generally that you have fairly good expansive qualities throughout your thorax and pelvis. 
that shows me then that you have control over those elements. So like, not that you can just lay on your back and express hip flexion, right? But now we stand you up against gravity and you can actually go through this full excursion through the axial skeleton, and the extremities. And so if you have that available to you, then I don't have to worry about, can you change levels when we're starting to teach you a little bit more of a fundamental cutting competency, right? I don't have to worry about that when I say we're going to sprint and, you know, certain athletes, like they get to you and they can't even go through enough excursion at the hip to show you the big shapes that you want during linear acceleration. But I know that this kid has that because we've gone through uh, squatting, lateral lunging, split squatting, right? And at the same time, we're teaching them, you know, marches, different skipping activities so that they're, again, going through this full excursion under differing conditions and they're doing it in a way that's relatively specific to sprinting. And then of course, when we're doing open drills, they're gonna be sprinting and changing directions already. But if then I can have these more uh, weight room style exercises, as my way of working on movement competency and control against gravity, now I'm able to maintain this full excursion against their own body weight. So I know that they can manage position against their own body weight and they can do it in a variety of contexts. So now over time, I can start to add load to that. I can start to challenge them to maintain that ability and be resilient and robust against different loads. And now I have far more confidence that when we go to put them into higher level change of direction work, or we're trying to drive specific outputs, right? Like I want to see their RSI improve, or I want to see their vert improve. Um, I want to see their, you know, 40 improve, right? At that point later in their development, I have the fundamental competencies to then superimpose fitness and output on top of it, as opposed to getting somebody later or not developing that stuff early. And now it's like, okay, well, you know, you want to get faster or you want to change directions more effectively, but you have 60 degrees of hip flexion available to you. And we got like 29 degrees of ankle dorsiflexion. So when you go to hit the ground, it's like an iron rod hitting the ground to change directions. And we get no return of elastic energy and you get stuck in the cut, right? And so it's like, at that point, we have to improve position first and then we have to build it back up, right? Through the cutting sequence. Whereas if somebody is developed from a young age in all of these different movement competencies, I'm fairly, I'm fairly confident that I'm gonna be able to superimpose those elements on top of it. Love everything you just said here. Let's let's work through this a little more because I think it's a really important concept and it's really helpful in terms of bridging the gap from like you have your positions you need to be able to get into to perform certain activities. Once you understand that, you can kind of take the idea of position and bring it all the way up to your highest level intensity activities you're gonna have to perform. And so let's go back to this idea of expansion yep. and changing levels. Do you just explain a little bit more about exactly what you mean by expansion, why it's important and how that's going to relate to an athlete being able to change levels? Yeah. So, so expansion is one of the, the two strategies we have to combat against gravity. And again, this, I'll always bring this back to Bill Hartman's model and, and what he's taught me has kind of really helped um, open my eyes to some of these elements. Um, and I'll actually bring this back to an athlete I worked with yesterday um, with, with this same concept. So the ability to expand, right, is simply the ability to, in some cases, move fluid volume or air volume or both into that space, right? In order to <clears throat> move in a certain direction, I have to be able to create an expansive strategy in that direction. So if we're looking at like the, the tissue standpoint around a region, right, I need to be able to eccentrically orient that tissue. I have to be able to lengthen the tissue in some cases, it's going to be a yielding strategy, which is more of a connective tissue giving way. In some cases, it's more going to be an eccentric strategy of the muscle itself. But if I want to move into a space, I have to be able to shift fluid and or air volume into that space to allow me to move in that direction. If I can't do that, I cannot move through compressive, concentrically oriented tissue. I can't move in that direction because there's no gradient to allow me to move that way. So let's say when we contract something, right, we're going to compress the muscle. It's going to squeeze fluid out of that space and into the opposing side. If we look at it from a joint perspective, if I'm going to concentrically orient muscle on one side and move a bone in that direction, I have to be able to push fluid volume out of that side of the joint and into the opposing side. So again, that allows me to move through this excursion. So if I want to move through a squat, let's say, and that's going to require like a full squat requires the greatest excursion of hip, knee and ankle flexion, right? Traditional flexion to be able to drop my center of mass and lower my body. In order to do that, I have to be able to demonstrate 
a full expansion of both the pelvis and the thorax to sit into the deepest squat, right? If I can't do that, I'm going to have restrictions in those capabilities, right? And so that's why breathing becomes such an important component because every time you breathe, your whole system has to be able to expand and compress, right? And if I can't do that, I'm still gonna find a way to inhale and exhale. It's just not gonna be a full excursion of the system. And so that's why the squat becomes such a valuable assessment. It's like, it can already tell me right away, where are the areas of compression and expansion and where are you restricted in your access? So if I'm watching you squat, right? I need to see the ability to uh, create an expansive strategy, an ER, a lower posterior um, expansive strategy initially as I descend in the squat, because that's gonna be my, like, my uh, initial ER phase through the first 60 degrees of hip flexion. And then as I move through like 60 to 90 and down into even 120, that's going to be more of an IR anterior expansion kind of phase where I'm going to have this mutation of the sacrum um, and this middle propulsive bias. And then as I go down below that, I'm again going to need counter mutation, but this is going to be again, a posterior expansion. Um, and I need a full expansion of the pelvis and thorax at that point. So the deeper I go through this range of motion, the more I have to fill the pelvis from the bottom up with fluid, and the more I have to fill the thorax from the bottom up with air. And so if I can't do that, it's gonna restrict my ability to lower my center of gravity, right? And so at the same time, if I look at a cut, right? As I go to position my leg outside of my base of support, I need to be able to expand and push fluid volume in that direction down into the pelvis to position my leg. And so that's going to be my, my positioning orientation of the leg outside of my base of support. That's an ER expansive bias. And then I'm going to hit the ground and I'm immediately going to begin to transition from an ER expansive bias to this overcoming strategy uh, internally in the, in the pelvis, right? Where I'm going to compress, I'm going to IR. I still need certain elements of expansion, but now this is my resisting continued deformation into the ground. If I didn't overcome when I hit the ground, I would just keep moving down and I would get stuck in the cut or I'd be a wet spot as Bill says. So like I need that strategy to push back up. But as I'm doing that, I need to be able to lower my center of gravity, especially related to the angle and the velocity of the cut. So if I'm bringing a lot of speed into the cut and it's a very sharp cutting angle, I'm going to need greater ankle, knee and hip dorsiflexion. I have to be able to lower my center of mass more, which is going to require more of this expansive capability. Otherwise, I'm going to, again, hit like a stiff rod where I can't continue to change levels. And then on the way out, I have to be, and this, again, requires me to push fluid volume down into the pelvic diaphragm to be able to create this expansive strategy to go down, right? Because, again, we come back to this, um, this principle of I can only move in the direction that I can expand. So if I can't push fluid volume down into the pelvis, I can't go down. I just keep coming back up. And so if I can't lower my center of gravity, now I'm going to have a more vertically oriented ground reaction force. I'm going to get stuck in the cut because I can't store the uh, elastic energy with a yielding strategy that's effective to allow me to maximize the stretch shortening cycle. And then when I come out of it, because I'm so concentrically oriented, I'm probably going to have to take a number of steps to actually create this propulsive strategy out of the cut, because instead of being able to decelerate my mass and momentum, by effectively absorbing or accepting the force by distributing it across the system. Now I'm gonna have a very stiff ground contact. I get no storage and release of elastic energy. And so I have to rely on more steps to get out of the cut, or I have to rely on a yielding strategy somewhere else in the system that would not necessarily be desirable. So you're gonna see athletes who can't lower their center of gravity like that. You're gonna see them bend at the spine, right? or you're going to see them twist at a knee, or you're going to see them get sort of some sort of um, kind of presentation at the foot where they're going to get a twist through the foot or the ankle, right? They start to create these turns that you would typically need to load a cut, and they create it somewhere else. Because as I go into a cut, as I said, I need to be able to turn in that direction. So I need a posterior expansive strategy as I'm loading that cut, and then I need to have an overcoming strategy that pushes me back out of that. So with all of that in mind, my ability to expand through at least a certain range of motion, my ability to excurse and demonstrate expansive capabilities to allow me to lower my center of gravity, especially in a multi-directional context, is huge. And so this was a, kind of an example yesterday with an athlete I'm working with. Um, he is, again, very compressed, 
very high level football player, um, extremely limited in his excursion. So he's a narrow individual. He does not have much external rotation whatsoever. So like on the table, he'll present with a lot of IR, right? And everyone's like, oh, well, he's got great IR. But we know that that's not really like IR relative motion wise within the pelvic girdle. He's getting that from orientation of his pelvis forward and he's losing his external rotation field as a result. So he's very stiff, very overcoming, again, very explosive. But when he hits the ground, he, he typically hits the ground with almost like a completely extended lower extremity right away. So it's like, a, if you just see this, if you watch in slow motion, you see a jolt basically going through the whole body and it's very stiff. And then he relies on the inside leg to finish the deceleration and reaccelerate him out. So he doesn't get enough projection coming out of his final foot uh, plant step. So we're watching him transition yesterday from like a shuffle to a retreating lateral run. And he was struggling like crazy. He kept rounding out of the cut and kept getting up to the front of the ball of his foot on his final foot uh, contact too quickly. So he's planting his left leg. He's getting to the left ball of his foot right away. He's getting no medial heel contact and he's rounding the cut to go like way out into left field. And so we kind of worked on some like quick hip, quick uh, hip turn stuff where we're really focused on being able to lower his center of gravity. And then we also like kind of put into that a little bit of some like campo med ball chops um, and different like campo activities to try to, to try to get a little bit more of a posterior yield to allow him to change levels more effectively. And so after that, we were able to improve things a little bit, but that's a perfect example of you got an extremely elastic, bouncy, highly compressed athlete who can't change levels well, who doesn't have much excursion available to him to be able to turn, to be able to lower his center of gravity. Um, and because of that, it restricts his change of direction performance, not because he can't produce enough force, not because he can't utilize elastic you know, energy particularly well in a short ground contact, but because in the specific context of change of direction, especially with sharper cuts and higher velocities, it demands a greater ability to yield, to store elastic energy, and to change levels. And if you don't have expansion qualities, you can't do that. Anything you want to follow up with, Rufus? No, keep going. <laughs> Love it. Let's let's keep going with this. <clears throat> oh, so or, or is a question, man. He comes up with all these great questions, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I was gonna tell you guys when you said the questions over. Some of these were like really good questions. Like they I had to sit with these for a little while and and especially some of the ones um you know, like what qualities make someone fast and, and things like this. Like I really had to think through some of these for, you know, the first time in a while. And it was really useful for me. It was a nice little exercise to help kind of continue to refine my model and figure out what's important to me. So you guys, you, you have good questions, which is awesome. I'm, I'm going to show you how much control I got over this. What questions? Groovers, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I know you're, I know you're the man back there just pulling all the strings. You're like, we need to ask this. this. Yeah, He's the, the puppet, puppet master. <laughs> <laughs> didn't know we sent out questions yeah <laughs> I love Rufus, it. you you can barely work instagram so someone's got to do the behind the scenes here that's it that's it <laughs> i can't work instagram at all except get on my computer i got no, i got an instagram page i got no idea how to post to it <laughs> <laughs> i love it so justin we talk about expansion and level change yeah. And that can apply to either your linear speed work or your multidirectional. But the multidirectional is going to have more, I mean, there'll be some turning component in linear work, but your multidirectional is going to mo have more of a turning component. So how does that relate to expansion? How does that relate to how two sides of the body may have to do two different things to achieve that? Yeah, that, and that's, that's a big component. So one of the topics I think we were talking about was, you know, what's the difference between training linear and change of direction or multidirectional speed, right? And to me, that, that kind of underlies one of them. So in a linear acceleration or linear sprinting context, you, you need a lot less of this posterior expansive strategy. You need a lot less of, I mean, honestly, even in an anterior expansive strategy to have internal rotation, uh, but you need a lot less expansion in general. You can get away with a lot more, right? Because we're going straight ahead in a straight line. There's much less excursion of these ranges of motion required to deal with the, uh, the forces associated with it, right? So yeah, you definitely need a certain level of like hip flexion, knee flexion, and dorsiflexion to be a good sprinter because if you can't achieve a decent shape, 
right? Where you split the arms and legs, right? Altus talks about shapes and I love that concept, right? So for linear acceleration, we should see big open shapes where we're gonna see one arm going well behind the body. We're gonna see one arm coming well up in front of the body and we're gonna see a big split of the, the hips, right? And that allows me to then actively attack the ground from above to impart more horizontally directed forces in a shorter ground contact. So if I don't have that capability, that can be a problem from a linear sprinting context, but you can definitely get away with more because the reality is you need much less of a delay strategy in a linear sprinting context, right? What, the, what both sides of the body are doing is a lot more similar when you're sprinting because the ground contact is so short and you're not having to change directions and orientation of force application, you're going forward the whole time, right? So you can get away with a lot more. So walking, right, requires more of a delay than sprinting, right? I got to hold one side of the body back and through a longer excursion of ground contact to advance the other. But when I'm sprinting, I'm landing very close to maximum propulsion. And so I don't need as much excursion. Now, if you have somebody who's so limited that they can't even express 90 degrees of hip flexion, let's say, that's going to be too limited to actually maximize performance. And I would say you need more hip flexion. And then you also need a certain degree of hip extension, right? Especially in, in linear acceleration. As you get to top speed, because contacts are so short, you're not going to truly reach hip extension on almost any contact, right? It's going to be too quick. But if you were talking about an acceleration context, classic hip extension is, is pretty important. Um, because if you don't have that, you're going to start um, shortening your ability to express these longer contacts associated with linear acceleration. So I want to see longer ground contact, more propulsive force imparted to the ground in the second half of the ground contact phase, which has been shown recently be, to be a very important element to linear acceleration performance. And so if you can't extend your hip, you're already going to be more frequency biased. And this is kind of a, an interesting element to working with bigger, more compressed athletes. So you would think like bigger, stronger guy, they're going to be more, uh, more kind of projection biased, right? They're going to really focus on pushing into the ground. They're going to displace their center of mass horizontally. And they're going to, we're, they're going to be somebody who we have to work on like elasticity and frequency. Right. But I found that that's not necessarily the case. So if you work with somebody like me, for example, you know, I, I had force production for days as somebody who was like a power lifter, Olympic lifter type individual. But when I sprint, I tend to short my excursion, especially in initial acceleration and try to rely on frequency because I don't have hip extension, right? I don't have anything near hip extension, especially on one side compared to the other. And so when you have somebody like that, they can have all the force production in the world. They're not going to project well forward through space because they can't continue to push until the end of their ground contact, especially in the first few steps where that's more relevant. So that's important, right? You need enough expansive capabilities to have enough internal rotation and enough hip flexion to be able to move through this early to middle phase of gait. That being said, once you have that, you don't need more, right? More is not better in a linear sprinting context. But if we're talking multi-directional speed and change of direction performance, especially as angle of the change of direction uh, gets sharper and the velocity with which you're entering the cut gets higher, now you need a greater excursion because the more velocity you come in with and the sharper the change of direction, the longer the ground contact is going to need to be, the more it's going to be a multi-step process. And then on top of that, the more you're going to have to lower your center of gravity to allow you to uh, impart a impulse that actually decelerates you and then reaccelerates you in the opposite direction. And then from a turning perspective, we have to appreciate that all of this is turning to a degree, right? Within the, the context of the body, right? So if I cut or I change directions, I actually have to turn ipsilaterally as I load that cut. And so an ipsilateral return uh, turn is going to require an ipsilateral posterior expansive strategy an anterior compressive strategy and a contralateral anterior expansive strategy and posterior compressive strategy to turn the axial skeleton into the cut. And so that is what allows me to access this loading phase where I'm loading through early to middle propulsion, right? And so that allows me to uh, accept these forces, to apply a braking force effectively as I load into the cut and rotate, and then to take advantage of the storage and release of elastic energy to push back out of the cut, I'm going to need a posterior compressive strategy ipsilaterally, an anterior expansive strategy, 
and then a posterior uh, expansive strategy contralaterally and an anterior compressive strategy to get me out of the cut. Oh, look, my buddy came in. Um, so, <laughs> so we're going we're gonna to have to push out of the cut and turn the opposite way. So if I don't have that capability, and let's say I'm trying to do like a 90 plus degree cut all the way up to 180 degrees, that is going to restrict my ability to get into and out of that cut effectively. And so if I go on the table, right, and I'm lacking early hip flexion, or I'm lacking, lacking like middle range hip flexion, and I'm compressed, and I'm shoved forward, and I'm anteriorly oriented posteriorly, and or I've superimposed an anterior compression on that, which is going to steal my IR, now I'm going to have a really hard time turning and loading that cut. And as I said earlier, you're going to have to get that turn from somewhere. And you're going to have to get the lowering of the center of gravity from somewhere, or you're going to be the person who can't lower their center of mass. They hit the ground like a stiff rod, and then they have to rely on either uh, frequency or incredibly elongated ground contact to get out of the cut. And we don't want that because some of the main contributors to change of direction performance, even in the literature, and coaches have been talking about this forever, but now the literature is starting to catch up, is going to be things like a short, the shortest final foot contact you possibly can lowering of the center of gravity, especially in the penultimate foot contact, uh, the ability to orient your forces horizontally. So they've actually shown like less vertical forces uh, is important and resultant forces overall aren't really that relevant in a change of direction context. It's all about the orientation of force application and the horizontal to vertical force application ratio. And so that all plays into this ability to turn and to lower your center of gravity. Because if I hit the ground and I can't turn in that direction, let's say, and I start to see some sort of compensatory strategy where may, maybe my shoulders have to rotate too much into the cut, or I start to shoulder sway out over the cut as an IR compensatory strategy, because I don't have the ability to actually get it from the hip, knee, and ankle and foot. Now I'm going to start to change my force application angle relative to my center of mass. So my foot plant becomes more vertical, right? It becomes more under my base of support as opposed to outside of it. And so now I can't effectively apply a horizontally directed braking impulse. I can't apply a horizontally directed propulsive impulse. And so I slow myself getting out of the cut and I can't deal with those forces as well. So in a closed change of direction context, that penultimate step and even the step prior to the penultimate step are going to be incredibly important. And even in a reactive scenario, if I am able to reposition that inside leg, deal with some of the, the braking forces necessary to decelerate myself before I put that final foot contact in the ground, now I can minimize ground contact in the last contact and I can get out faster, right? I can rely on that last foot contact for more of a propulsive force application. So all of that comes to this ability to change levels to create an expansive strategy. And again, to rotate enough into the side that I'm cutting to and to get out of it. And then from a health standpoint, um, I would say that that capability is huge from a maintenance of health for change direction performance element. If you can't do that, if you have no ability to turn and to achieve this triple flexion, this classic triple flexion of the, the ankle, knee and, and, uh, and hip, then you're going to find that somewhere else. And so maybe that's a twist through the knee again. And now you have uh, stressors that are going to be applied to medial, uh, you know, the medial compartment of the knee where you're going to get ACL, MCL, meniscus, all these tissues under load to a great degree. You might have overuse issues where you're getting your, your uh, IR from a compensatory strategy. And now you have something like a VL that's going to be lit up and concentrically oriented all the time, right? And that's going to pull in certain elements that can cause low oxygen and low nutritional environments and cause pain over time. So now you have a situation where you're going to get in and out of that cut, but not only is performance going to potentially be lacking, but you're also going to struggle to distribute your stresses across the system effectively, which is important for your long-term health, as well as your acute health. Because I think a lot of times that's where we'll see um, acute tissue damages occur where athletes are hitting really aggressive, sharp cuts where they're reliant on um, essentially connective tissues alone to be able to handle those loads and they're not able to distribute the stresses effectively and then something gives. You got that Rufus? <laughs> not at all. No notes needed. 
It's just There's like up here. It's like sitting, it's like sitting in the purple room. <laughs> you know? and, and so we'd go in the purple room and we'd have these great conversations, right? And I just walk out there. What did he just say? <laughs> I feel the same way hanging around Bill and everybody else there, whether it's Campo or Ty or anybody else. Like, I need to go back and listen to that 15 more times. This, this, this is, uh, no, I mean, it's really good stuff. How, um, how, this might be a stupid question, but I'm sure there's somebody out there that's going to want to know this answer. Okay, so how do you, just shortly, I know Corey's got some more questions, but just shortly, how do you train that then? I mean, what, yeah, you know, we've talked about it, you know, and it's great, and the explanation is great, but give me something I can do on Monday. Yeah. So, yeah, no, that, that's an awesome question. I just I just noticed that my screen says Monica signs. By the way, that's going to be fun. Yeah, well, uh, you know, I've, I've been looking at that because I got an email from her. Yeah, yeah. And I'm thinking, who's this girl? <laughs> I'm using I'm using my fiance Zoom as she goes around in the background doing laundry. Right, and well, I comes in and out. In order to get on, so I can figure out who I'm getting strange emails from. You know. <laughs> well, you you've met her because she went to the intensive as well. Oh, I have. Yeah, she was at the intensive after me. She's a PT. Oh, I'm sorry. Not, yeah, I think I remember her now. You'll, yes. you'll, when you see her, I think you'll remember. She's. Uh, I'm not, allow I'm not allowed to talk to the girls other than to say hi. <laughs> there's certain rules, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. So to your question, though, like there's there's a lot of elements. So that's why my assessment, I think, is is so valuable to me. Because, you know, you can, you can train, there's so many different ways that you can train this. And some of them are very traditional, right? It's just like understanding what, you know, looking at multi-directional speed as a skill, right? Some of this is going to be skill work, right? Because they might have the range of motion available to them, but they need to be able to apply it in the context of change of direction, right? Or maybe they need more force application because as we just talked about, you know, there are certainly going to be people who are, let's say, too compressed or too stiff to be able to change levels effectively. But you're also going to get people who don't have enough compressive strategy to get themselves out of the cut and to handle those forces to stop their downward momentum. So that's a totally different training strategy altogether when you have that person. And so for me, it's like I need to assess where they are right now and what they're lacking. So we'll do like full table test and uh, global movement assessment, right? So look at all your orthopedic table measures. And then we'll look at a squat, a toe touch, a trunk rotation, a load propulsion test, all of that. But especially with the young coaches that I'm working with, I tell them you can learn a ton from watching someone squat and watching their load propulsion test. And you know what? Let's even throw out the load propulsion test. Watch them march, right? Take a video of them marching and watch how they excurs through that, that range of motion. That is literally the same thing as a load propulsion test. It's just there's differing constraints but you can get a great deal of information. And I think these strategies that we see people move with are far more maintained across movement than we give credit, right? There's a lot of people who get down on things like the FMS and, and other movement screens. And it's like, yeah, if you take them as black and white, it's like, okay, the FMS score of 17, what does that mean? But like, it's all movement, right? So if I watch someone squat, I can get a lot of information from that. If I watch them do a hurdle step over, that to me is a variation of a low propulsion test, right? And so you can get a lot of information from that as well. So I'm using my movement measures to look at position. Can, do they have the ability to achieve the position? If they don't, and let's use me as an example because it's easy. And, and Campo has been working with me on this for a while, right? I am a classic, super compressed individual with a powerlifting and Olympic lifting background. Um, was an offensive lineman in football, which, you know, turning is not really something we're particularly interested in. We want to resist turning all the time. And so my background biases me towards being very stiff, very compressed and pretty strong, but not really good at turning or lowering my center of gravity. Well, I, I tend to push back up really well. And so for me, you know, we were working on improving athleticism and change direction because I'm at a point where I don't really care about being like super strong anymore. I want to be able to do athletic things. I want to demonstrate things for my athletes. I want to play in men's flag football leagues and, and have fun with friends um, so we were restoring some of this, this excursion because for me, from a you know, jumping perspective, a change of direction perspective and a sprinting perspective, uh, being able to access that range of motion to a greater degree, not only has health, but performance implications. So for me, if I'm looking at myself on the table, 
And I see these restrictions where I'm like, initially I was lacking early phase hip flexion. I had less than zero internal rotation, right? My internal rotation, my hip was external rotation. Um, I'm compressed all over the place. I'm bottoming out of squat even before I hit parallel, like not even close. And so all of that is a big red flag. It's like, yeah, this guy's not going to change levels well in a cut and he's going to struggle getting into the cut. So that's something we can work on, right? He's also not going to have a particularly good counter movement in a vertical jump. His, his counter movement is going to be uh, stiff. It's going to not store a lot of elastic energy. He's going to be more reliant on muscle and this compressive strategy to, to kind of push back up as opposed to the yielding and the overcoming strategy that we'd want to see. And so for that person, I'm going to work on things that recapture those ranges of motion first and foremost. It's like, we need you to expand enough to be able to get on the table and show us some degree of hip internal rotation. You got to show us a little bit more hip flexion. You got to show us a better squat. I need to know that you can flex your, your body or you can expand your body and you can actually flex as you descend and you can eccentrically orient your pelvic diaphragm to a greater degree to push fluid volume down and change levels because getting you more propulsion and more output is not going to improve you until you can maximize this element of it. So that would be like my position bucket. It's like I'm assessing an athlete. They can't even get into the position that I want them to achieve effectively to change directions, to jump, to do those things or to sprint for that matter. Because if you don't have, again, this, this early to middle phase hip flexion, um, you're probably gonna be pretty restricted in your ability to excurse through a full range of motion, to attack the ground and deliver propulsive forces, or in the case of max velocity sprinting, deliver like a high vertical ground reaction force in the first half of contact, which elite sprinters demonstrate this ability to strike from above really well. And so if you can't do that, we gotta improve position first. And then I look at force application, right? And this could be any number of different um, assessments. But for me, uh, easiest one is jump profile. So we'll look at a counter movement, no counter movement, four jump, single leg jump. Um, I have access to a gym aware. I'll use gym aware with certain clients where I'm looking at force velocity profile. But generally what I want to get a sense of is, do you have enough force production capabilities to handle the ability to get into and out of a cut, right? So there's a lot of force that needs to be applied especially in a sharper cut, especially in a higher velocity cut. And then from a sprinting perspective, can you at least demonstrate a substantial amount of mass specific force production in a relatively short contact window, which is where something like your four jump or your RSI comes in. So I kind of get a general sense of their force production qualities. If they don't have that, then it comes down to, okay, like maybe we need to work some plyometric progressions. Maybe we need to work on general strength training, right? We need to teach you how to, if you're a lower pressure individual, you're more of a uh, expanded connected tissue biased individual with a narrow presentation. Maybe that person will benefit from a general strength training program where it's like, we're going to teach you to concentrically orient your pelvic diaphragm under load, right? We're going to teach you an overcoming strategy and we're going to stiffen your tissues a little bit so that your rubber band is a little bit thicker, right? And now you can actually resist deformation. So that's your person who either going into a cut, they descend too deep and they can't get out of it and they get stuck in it, or they plant their foot so wide and so stiff and they don't descend at all because they know they can't get out of it. And that was a big eye opener for me. It was like, if I see somebody like a young girl, let's say, low pressure individual, very narrow, tends to look like a baby deer, no strength training history, they may have the ability to sit and bottom out of squat all day, every day, very easily, but you put them in a cut and they don't lower their center of gravity at all, right? And you try to cue them, you try to coach them and it's not happening. They hit the ground with a very stiff limb. They don't go anywhere and they don't actually lower to store and release elastic energy or they jump and they don't lower their center of gravity at all. And you're like, well, what's going on here? Like they have this excursion. They, you put them on the table. They got hip flexion for days. They got everything they need but then you have them resist gravity, you have them move fast and they can't do it. And I think intrinsically their nervous system understands that if they go down and they actually go through a greater excursion, they're not coming back up with any sort of appreciable force production. And so I think that's somebody who general strength training is going to be very, very valuable for. And then for me, it's motor skill. So, okay, you have force production, both at high velocities and somewhat slower speeds. You have the position. I know you have access to enough of this to get in the position I want. But when we do it in the context of a certain drill, you can't do it, right? It doesn't work. So we'll use yesterday as an example. We're doing like a two shuffle as if he's mirroring an offensive player to a hip turn retreating lateral run. 
Um, I was talking to somebody last night about like in a linebacker's case, this would be them like following the tight end down the seam in, in a coverage situation. So we do that drill and he demonstrates for me that he can't hip turn one way particularly well and he can't lower his center of gravity, get his medial heel to the ground and be able to get in and out. But we work, let's say we work on it and he can demonstrate for me he has enough excursion to do it and I know he's strong enough from a force production standpoint. Now it's about the specific skill. And so that's where we're going to use a lot of like Lee's progressions. We're going to use reactive change of direction work. We're going to pull him out of the change of direction work in a reactive environment or an open environment. And we're going to do a closed skill. So in his case, yesterday, we did a lot of like hip turn and push off activities, right? Like quick hips with a band to encourage uh, like basically ipsilaterally. So he's turning to the right, holding the band with his right leg or right arm. And we're encouraging this posterior strategy, posterior expansive strategy on the backside of the pelvis and thorax to allow him to turn and orient in that direction. And then I'm cueing him, hey, when you hip turn, I need you to stay in the tunnel. I need you to hit the ground in a place where you have ankle, knee, and hip dorsiflexion so that you have something to push off of so that you're not so stiff at ground contact. And then when you do push off, I need you to get your entire medial arch to the ground. So we rep that in a closed uh, change of direction drill kind of context where it is a little bit more uh, maybe internally cued, right? We're thinking about different positions and sensations and we're trying to get him to, to correlate this to something that's more open. And then we put him back in the whole drill and we say, okay, now you need to find that at higher speeds in a reactive environment and we rep it there. And then finally, is it a capacity issue, right? So if it's a capacity issue in terms of like your, uh, energy system development or your ability to perform specific work, maybe you can have the force production, the position and the uh, motor skill, but you hit a certain point in the second half of the game or towards the end of a workout and all of that goes to hell, right? And that's to me a really underappreciated element in change of direction performance. Like we can get somebody to do this really well initially, but what if you can't sustain that across the course of a game? because we know that fatigue is gonna alter motor control and that's gonna alter position force application strategy and motor skill output in a change of direction context. So for me, it's like, can we get this person to then repeat that over time? And kind of classic training the V concept from Joel Jameson, but it's like, we're gonna start with development of general qualities like overall aerobic fitness and ATB PCR capability. So that's like your, your absolute excursion of high quality change of direction work and linear sprinting and output. And then your aerobic is building, you know, mitochondrial density, capillarization, central kind of factors that are gonna help make a more robust circulatory system. And then we narrow that V until right before something like, let's say a football player going to camp, we're working very specific repeats where we're literally doing change of direction drills with certain time constraints and certain rest periods to kind of mimic what would happen during the course of play. And then we'll repeat that for sets. And that set will be indicative of like a drive in a football game. So I want to see you be able to go through, you know, four, six, eight drives of high quality work and not fall apart. And so that's where I would start to work on, you know, again, we'll start general. We'll make sure we have the aerobic engine to support that work, make sure we have the quality change of direction and sprint mechanics and, and output that we need. And then it's, can you repeat that, recover quickly and do it again with high levels of quality? So for me, it's like, we got to figure out where are you? right? What is, what is your limiter and how can we train that limiter? Um, and so, you know, what you can do on Monday is kind of figure out what is it that's stopping this person, right? If it's, if it's a lowering the center of gravity issue and you see that they can't, you know, hit the ground and achieve this change of levels that you want, or they can't quote unquote play in the tunnel during some sort of multi-directional speed quality, or they're doing linear sprinting and you just see this restriction in their ability to separate their hips in linear acceleration. Um, you have to figure out like, is that a positional issue or is the position there and they just don't have the force production to handle this certain context or is it a motor skill? And then you have somebody who can't get out of the cut. Let's say they keep getting stuck in the cut. Well, again, what is causing that? And then you go and you apply your training strategy and then you retest whatever it is that your KPI is that tells you whether you're improving that element and then you rinse and repeat. Very good. Hopefully that was, hopefully that ramble got back to an answer that answered your question. That was great. No, it was great. I mean, you don't, you know, you don't hear many guys talking about how to do an assessment. Yeah. 
Yeah. And that's, that's something that like Bill has really helped me with over time. Um, that what I just outlined, like was a hundred percent inspired and stolen from Ty. Um, it's, it's stuff that a lot of people have contributed to over time that I found useful for me. And then the capacity at the end guys from, uh, like, uh, I think it used to be called train adapt evolve. I think they now call themselves evolve, but it's, it's Aaron Davis and Patrick Estes just really talking about, um, how physiology and structure impacts recovery impacts performance in, impacts the ability to coordinate um, and how position and physiology interplay. And you learn about all these things and it's like, okay, where do I, where do I start? Right. There's so many different elements to this and they all interact. Right. And so it's like, I found over time that I was doing a lot of the things that I thought were right. And they were good quality training elements, but it wasn't helping specific individuals. And it's because it's not what they need, right? Maybe somebody else needed that strategy, but that person didn't need that. They needed more position, right? Um, I had a linebacker who I've worked with for a long time who, uh, you know, he, he had a history of, of knee issues, issues there. 600 pound squatter came from a, a, a division one program that was very heavy into the lifts and into getting really strong, which was great, but it stole so much of his excursion range of motion that getting in and out of his cuts was like molasses, right? And so not only was he coming off an injury, but he was also a lot slower than he needed to be. And, and at first I was like, this guy's a 600 pound squatter. Like his jump should be higher. Like his cuts should be faster. And my, you know, my strength training mindset was very much like, man, what's going on here? And then you start to realize like the guy has no hip excursion. His tissues are incredibly stiff. Um, you know, a counter movement and vertical jump is not enough force and momentum to deform his tissues. And a cut, when he goes to cut, he's getting stuck in that cut because he can't express the velocity to position uh, his leg and get out of it, right? The external rotation, the expansion to get into and out of a cut that's necessary. So he's just getting buried into the ground all day, every day. Um, and that's necessitating some compensatory strategies at different joints that has led to pain and injuries. The guys with like big toe issues, knee issues, um, things like that. It's like, okay, maybe this guy doesn't need to get stronger right now. Maybe we got to get him some more available range. We got to work the skill and then we got to develop the elasticity that he probably doesn't have in a variety of ways. So for him, it was like, you know, we're going to do ply general plyometric progressions, but we're also going to teach you along the way to actually capture a yielding strategy because right now it's just too much stiffness. And I use the, the image I get in my mind is like an iron rod being thrown at the ground, right? You like hit the ground with that iron rod. It just kind of bounces right there and doesn't go anywhere, right? But if you hit a really filled up basketball on the ground, like that ball bounces hard and it goes all over the place. And for me, he was the iron rod who was just so stiff, so compressed and so restricted that he couldn't get out of a cut. He couldn't pro uh, produce this yielding strategy in a counter movement jump or in a loading phase of a cut to get out of it. And so that necessitated a different training strategy. Now, if you're working with younger kids, there's a lot more on your plate, right? Like sometimes you improve force production um, if they've never trained before and all of a sudden position cleans up, right? Motor skill cleans up because they just got stronger relative to their own body mass. And I had a few of those kids as well recently where it's like, you know, you got a 13 year old hockey kid who wants to get faster, right? Mom and dad says we need more agility. We need more speed to, to make the high school team, but you assess him and he's got no range of motion available to him. And he's never trained before and he's kind of like floppy um, and he started doing change of direction work with him. And it's just like, he's, it's above his current level of capabilities, right? You could see him get stuck in the cut. You see him sway and dump. Um, you see him unable to handle the forces. So he'll hit the, uh, his final foot contact. He'll stop. But instead of being able to actually handle that load and then get back out, he's got to spin his wheels in place and then go back out of it. Um, you watch him sprint. And this is like, this is my favorite one, which is like watching them or listening to them sprint. And you can literally heal, hear them just fall to the ground every single step. Like they're, they're not sprinting, they're falling. And they're just trying to keep themselves from falling on their face because they can't handle the forces and velocity. Um, and so, yeah, we work on change of direction skills. We'll go through skip progressions. Um, we'll go through linear sprinting. We'll do sled work. Uh, we'll do chase games with younger kids. We'll do change of direction drills, all of that. But we'll put a bigger emphasis on some of their jumping and landing capabilities where they're going to have to start accepting force and producing force. Um, we're going to put a bigger emphasis on doing a goblet squat with really well, right? Doing body weight exercises like push-ups and rows, doing a good split squat and actually teaching them 
at these slower speeds to build up their force production. And lo and behold, a month later, all of a sudden their movement capabilities are 10 times better. And we haven't done anything that's focused on like, you know, real like low level activities like position. We just got them stronger and took them through a full excursion, a range of motion um, and things cleaned up on their own. You, you got them stronger, not necessarily in a weight room sense, but in a movement sense. Yeah. And, but you know what? They also got stronger in a weight room sense, right? Yeah. Like, you know, they yeah. went, they went yeah. from, that wasn't the main focus, right? I mean, it was, it was it was getting him to move better, which allowed him to move better in the weight room, which allowed him to lift more weight. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And that's that's the key is like figuring out what and, – and, again, it's two different things. So it's like maybe for the high-level athlete who's too stiff, it's getting them to capture that yielding strategy. So maybe we're doing some sort of band-assisted squatting activity, right? Maybe we're doing a box squat. Uh, maybe we're doing something that allows them like a drop clean or something like that, where the emphasis is on giving way and accepting force quickly and being able to go through that full excursion. And maybe that actually increases their, their strength because now they have a better yielding capability to store and release elastic energy, right? Which makes them able to produce more force quicker. With the other kid, it's like, I want to see them be able to show me a good goblet squat through the fullest excursion of range of motion with control. And now we're training. I mean, this is where, to me, like the old adage of, um, you know, good mobility training is strength training through a full range of motion. You know what I mean? Like when you have that, that sudden, that actually becomes true because now I can improve this athlete's squat and their load propulsion test, which on day one looked awful uh, because he's just never trained before, right? He's never had to control his body under external load through different ranges of motion. He simply just played sports and gotten whatever done needs to be done. Um, and now it's like, okay, I'm going to ask you, with this dumbbell in your hands, can you show me a full excursion in, in a squat where you can control your rib cage and your pelvis? You can keep your hip, knee, and ankle on train tracks. You can stay heel heavy as you change levels. Um, and so, yeah, like they, that improves their movement. That was the primary goal. But along the way, they're now lifting heavier weights. They're stronger relative to their body mass in some of the basic like body weight assessments we do. We'll look at you know push up capabilities pull-up capabilities or, you know, just squatting with a certain percentage of your body weight with a goblet dumbbell for a young kid. And then you throw them back on the jump mat and they do a vertical jump and they're jumping substantially higher. Right. And we have really haven't done that much jumping. It's like they needed that force production um, uh, strategy. They needed to be able to understand how to, to manage their body against external load. And now we're getting neural adaptations as well that allows them to produce more force quicker. So it's just figuring out like what this person is limited by and what they need. And then you train that, you reassess and you go at it again. Very good. Go ahead, Corey. Let's talk about your favorite topic, Rufus, deceleration. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> so Justin, can we stick with these two kind of archetypes you're describing of your stiffer person versus your more quote unquote compliant person who's just going to hit the ground and not be able to produce force back up. Yeah. And can we stick with those two archetypes in the context of a deceleration and explain why a delay strategy, posterior yield, whatever you want to call it is important for deceleration, what that's doing and how it's going to express itself in those two different people. Yeah. So, so as we said before, right, when you go into a cut, let's say we're going to decelerate, um, let's say we're doing some sort of lateral skill, right? We have to do a rotational stop, a shuffle stop, something like that, where I'm going to plant my foot laterally or even a speed cut in order to stop my lateral momentum going in that direction, right? I have to create this delay to hold that side of the body back to allow me to access this change in levels and this ipsilateral turn that is going to allow me to impart a breaking force to the ground, right? It's again, it's still force application. It's just in the context of me having to provide an impulse that stops my body from moving in one current direction, okay? So if I can't do that from a tissue uh, stiffness perspective, right? I am too compressed, I am too squeezed off, and I don't have any turns available to me. Because remember, as soon as I orient my pelvis forward, right? As soon as I anterior orient and my pelvis starts behaving as basically one unit, all of a sudden my delay strategy goes away, right? My ability to turn and express that becomes like a whole orientation of the body as opposed to an effective delay strategy where I'm getting relative motions. 
because from that, that early to middle phase of, of loading a cut or early to middle phase of propulsion, that's where my greatest relative motions are expressed, right? And that's what I need to be able to, to do. And then as I exit that, I'm actually going to try to stop those relative motions from happening so that I have a stable lower extremity to push off of. So as I'm going into the cut, and that's my deceleration phase, that's my lowering my center of gravity phase. If I am too stiff, not only can I not turn and delay that side ipsilaterally because I can't expand on the backside of the body and I can't create this, this yielding strategy that allows me to turn in that direction. Now I'm going to have a harder time, again, lowering my center of mass, flexing at the ankle, knee and hip. And in general, I'm going to have a harder time slowing myself. And so what I'm going to do is I'm either going to hit the ground very stiff and I'm going to have to rely on a different strategy to do it. So if somebody can't, if they have no, let's say no hip internal rotation whatsoever, right? they may actually start to get this lowering of the center of gravity by bending over at the back. So you'll see them kind of like um, round their, their mid back over their pull their pump handle down. They're going to get expansion right around below the level of the scap. Um, and you'll start to see this strategy of like, okay, I'm going to lower my chest and my center of mass, but it's basically just spinal flexion that's allowing me to get it. And I'm not getting the deformation at the hip, knee and ankle. Same thing would probably be demonstrated in this person's jump where they go through the lowering phase and they're going to become a back jumper, right? As, as some people would say, they start to round their body over to get deeper into the counter movement. And then they rely on then extending their spine to get themselves out. And they don't get a good storage and release of elastic energy. And that's the big thing. It's like, we want to maximize stretch shortening cycle performance because that's what allows me to impart higher forces in quicker ground contact time. So I need to be elastic, but if I can't load, then I can't explode back out. And that ipsilateral rotation, um, hip, knee, and ankle flexion, lowering the center of mass during deceleration is the storage of elastic energy. It's the storage of potential energy to allow me to then utilize that energy to get back out of the cut efficiently and effectively. So your person who's too stiff may not be able to do that effectively. And so they don't have the ability to, to produce those high forces at high velocities. So they get stuck in the cut, right? Or again, they hit the ground and they have to get it from somewhere else. And this, this kind of, I realized this a long time ago when I was working with uh, another high level linebacker, another 600 pound squatter, like guy you put on the gym aware and he can do 450 at like 0.6 meters per second for triples. And like, it's not even hard. And then he goes to do a vertical jump and his vertical jump was 27 inches. And I'm like, well, and this guy's trying to go to the NFL. And I'm like, well, that's not going to work. Like we need more there. So how is it that, you know, he's not like a fat guy, like he's a, you know, built guy, but over time, after talking to people like Campo and Ty at the time, we started realizing, you know, this, like this guy's body mass and his momentum in a counter movement jump is not enough to deform his tissues because his tissues are so thick from such chronic strength training and compressive elements that he can't utilize elastic energy. So he's basically just trying to like, max effort, no counter movement jump every time he's trying to do a counter movement jump for a height. And so we had to unload him, get him to expand more effectively, get him to go through a full excursion, and then teach him to apply higher forces at higher velocities as opposed to high forces at slow velocities. And so a lot of those force application um, kind of uh, strategies are really chronic in some of these well-trained stiff individuals. And so they don't have turning capabilities because they're, they're oriented forward, they're compressed posteriorly and a lot of times anteriorly. So because of that compression and the bias towards this push up, right, the stiffer tissue that's always resisting being pushed down from years and years of heavy strength training, now they can't actually change levels. They can't achieve a horizontally directed force application they can't decelerate well and store elastic energy. And the same thing goes from, let's say a linear stop. So if you're going straight ahead and you have to put your foot in the ground in what Lee would call like a lunge stop or like wide receiver coaches would call like a trigger step. If I can't slow or manage my center of mass well enough to capture an early propulsive strategy where my heel is going to hit first, first med head's going to go to the ground and then I'm going to translate the tibia through this middle propulsive range. If I can't do that, now you get all sorts of issues with tendinopathies, um, with all sorts of like knee pain and, and you know, lateral compartment pain where someone would say like, oh, I have IT man syndrome or I have pain on the outside of my knee, or you just can't decelerate as well. So this was a cool situation with an athlete I'm working with now where he came in, 
He's trying to get back on a team. Um, former fourth round draft pick. Um, guy's a freak, just a complete freak. But he'll tell you straight up when he comes in, I can decelerate really well on my right leg in my in my comeback routes. On my left leg, not so much. Can't do it, right? And you watch him, and it's because he's getting shoved so far forward on that left side that he can't capture the delay strategy posteriorly to store elastic energy in that early to mid phase to then impart enough impulse into the ground over long enough contact in that deceleration step to then get out of his break quickly when he's got a when he's got to plant off his left leg. So getting him back, and and I think I heard Bill say this talking about like the the posterior expansion in that context as a parachute, right? And that was a great image for me, just thinking of like the the pushing of air and fluid posteriorly during that lunge stop as being creating a parachute to slow myself down well, so that then I can use my next two steps to finish the decel and propel back out of the cut towards the quarterback on a comeback route to catch the ball. If I can't do that, I'm going to be slower and I'm going to require more steps to get to get stopped and get back the other way. And then on top of that, I'm probably also going to have some sort of injury or pain associated with that. It's not guaranteed, but you do that enough where you're hitting and you're landing basically four foot right away and trying to stop yourself on your big toe. And you're not getting this ability to excurse through a full range. And all of a sudden things start to hurt. Things start to get overloaded. Stress distribution is not effective. I can't yield in the connective tissue to allow me to distribute the stress across the system. And so now you have health consequences in addition to performance consequences. And then on the other end, as you said, we got the younger kid, uh, low training age, more narrow biased individual, kind of like a pylon getting shoved into the ground all the time, eccentrically oriented in pelvic diaphragm. Maybe they have turning capabilities available to them, but they're getting buried in the cut, right? So they can turn that way. They can capture posterior expansion. They can go down into the cut, but they can't get back out. And so that's somebody where you have to work more of this concentric pelvic diaphragm pushing up kind of activity, or you have to increase tissue stiffness to resist the deformation. And that's where traditional strength training can become very valuable, right? And at the same time, you have to be able to do that under high loads because the forces and velocities associated with change of direction are incredibly high. So if I want to decelerate well, as I go into the cut, I need to be able to create this overcoming strategy internally to push back up the minute my foot hits the ground. So if I can't capture that, that middle propulsive phase to stop myself from moving down into the cut and reverse directions to go out the other way, then my deceleration, A, it's going to take longer, right? I'm going to spend a lot of time going down and I'm going to get stuck in the cut, which elongates my ground contact time. And then as I come out, I can't get an effective push up, which throws my guts up and in, in the opposite direction. And so I don't exit the cut well, and I probably go straight up right? Because I need to be able to take the time to get my foot back under me so that then I can project horizontally, as opposed to somebody who can load, who can keep that foot outside of their center of gravity with a wide enough plant angle to direct their forces horizontally, and then get right back out horizontally. And then the other version of that is sometimes, as I said, you'll get the athlete who kind of intrinsically knows if I try to lower my center of gravity in this cut, if I try to go down and load the spring, I'm not coming back out. And so that's somebody who's like this lower pressure individual. They're relying on connective tissues for stability and control. And so they're going to hit the ground with a stiff lower extremity to try to not even go there, right? To try to not even go down into the cut. And again, that'll, that'll present itself in some sort of um, jumping activity as well, where you're going to see a very quick rebound, but they're not going to go down at all because they know if they go deep into the counter movement, they don't have the force production and the overcoming capabilities internally to get their guts back up off their pelvic diaphragm. And they just keep going down, right? And then they get stuck in the bottom, they get no return of elastic energy and they don't go very high. And so they've kind of intrinsically learned like to go higher, I just bounce quicker or I'm stiffer at ground contact than a cut, but that's not a sustainable strategy and it's not optimal for their change of direction capability. So for that, like, you know, we can definitely do general strength training, but I also like using like classic deceleration training where I'm pulling somebody into or like uh, kind of a progression where I'm going to have them run into a stop or I'm going to have them band accelerated into a stop. And so for somebody who needs to capture more of this yielding strategy, it might be band accelerated into the stop with a cue of allowing themselves to deform at ground contact 
right? To change levels and to, to yield to a degree when they hit the ground. With the other person, it's, hey, I need you to hit the ground and I need you to put on the brakes hard and strong. And to me, that's like, that's more specific, you know, whether it's eccentric or breaking rate of force development qualities, that's what you're training there. It's not the specific uh, plant angle. So a lot of people, you know, some people do deceleration training and then other people say, well, you know, deceleration training is use useless because it's not going to be the specific skill associated with change of direction, right? When your intent to get out of the cut, when your intent is to get out of the cut, you're going to use a different plant angle and a different strategy than when you know you're just stopping and holding them. But to me, it's, it's more about being able to capture some of these cues and the force production qualities, as well as the storage and release of elastic energy to be able to change levels appropriately and stop my lateral momentum. Um, and, and that's how you develop strength in a specific context to then be able to parlay that into your effective change of direction. Yeah, that was really well said. It's a lot of, essentially every time you change a direction, you need to redirect your momentum. Yeah. And that delay is essentially just buying you time to allow you to do that. And there's the two options are either you're too stiff, so you don't get enough of a delay, so you come forward too fast, and that's your stiff people. The other option is you delay too much and you don't put enough force into the ground to help get you out of that. Yeah. And, and so either, either way, you can lose that, that effective stretch shortening cycle that I think we're all after, right? And you can, you, you can lose it because you never deform enough to store it, or you can lose it because you take so long that the energy is dissipated as heat and you lost it, right? And so now you got to figure out how to get out of the cut or out of the jump without the return of elastic energy, and that doesn't work. Well, so the million-dollar question is, how are, you, how are you tracking these things to try to maximize someone's ability to get as much elastic energy as possible and try to, I guess, maximize their force velocity curve so that they are, they're stiff enough but not too stiff? Yeah. And that's, that's where having your KPIs comes in, right? So, so the squat is going to be a big one for me in terms of the too stiff people. Um, a lot of times with the too stiff people, you will see them restricted in some way, shape, or form in the squat. So uh, one of the individuals I was referred to earlier, one of the linebackers who's very stiff, he was actually still a narrower biased person, but had just layered years and years and years of compressive strategy. And he's a high-level athlete, so he's already kind of shaped like a, a yield sign. And so like, he's got this, this wider up top, very narrow pelvis, great for pushing back up, not so great for going down. And so I needed enough excursion through his range, through his extremity to be able to get him to lower his center of gravity. And specifically, I needed more of it on the left side. So we watch him squat and he's one of those guys who shifts over to the right side. He's got a very nice full posterior thorax on the right, relatively speaking, and posterior lower expansion on the right side to allow him to shift to the right in his squat. But that left side was just getting shoved forward from behind all day, every day. And so that was kind of a constant battle, but that was our tracker. It was like, are we getting a smoother, more fluid squat through a full excursion? Is it more even and less asymmetrical? And then can we use that in our change of direction context? So I film everything. Um, I have, I have years and years of videos of, of these athletes changing directions. And so like, what was really cool at the time with this athlete is I had a video of the previous year when he was coming off his ACL injury, when we were working him through, uh, his return to play protocol. And there were a couple changes of directions that I saw where I was just like, I know he's got to go back to, to football in like a week or two weeks. And like, my heart was in my throat because I'm looking at like an inside leg that is just demonstrating the most vicious knee valgus known to man. Right. And that was his strategy, right? He would try to cut off his inside leg all the time with this later propulsive strategy where his femur is internally oriented, his tibia is turned way out into external rotation, and he's trying to use that as his, his stop and decel or uh, reacceleration. And so I was like, you know, watching that, it was very concerning. The next year, you know, quarantine happened. We were training the whole time. We're working out outside. We're still tracking all of these things. And we were able to, to get him to the point where he was able, to, the, the drill is basically like a reactive shuffle. So like reacting to a stimulus, shuffling, turning into a linear acceleration, turning into a lateral run, whatever it is, it was a pretty open and complex drill um, that he might have to use in a covered situation where you have to move laterally and then transition that into different directions of acceleration to make a play. And videoing that, you could see that the strategy was totally different. And it was because he had recaptured some external rotation field. So he could actually reposition his inside leg now, as opposed to planning off the outside leg, inside legs getting dragged along for the ride into this knee valgus position. Now he could actually 
recapture that repositioning of the inside leg for reacceleration out of the cut. And so it was a much more effective distribution of stress. He was getting out of his cuts quicker than ever with incredible spring. Um, and then we watched the squat and he would you know, bottom out of squat at the end of a workout or at the end of a, you know, a warm up, And he'd just be like, man, that feels so good. Like it just feels so much more natural. There was no more of that. Like it was almost like a hesitation. If you ever worked with really stiff people, no, no one who's really stiff likes to test their body weight squat because it's uncomfortable because it probably like hurts to some degree and they feel like they're going to fall over. And now like he's able to sit into a deep squat and be very comfortable with that, um, be very effective there. And then it was a matter of, okay, we still got to continue to work on this rotational bias because he still had this right-sided expansive quality much more than the posterior left, which was always getting shoved forward. So we wanted to get him to be able to turn. Um, and so for that, like that, our KPI was the squat, right? Our KPI was the squat and the motor skill in the specific chain of direction element. Now for the other person, where force application is more the thing. And to be honest, we still tracked vertical jump. We just weren't able to do it as much until we got back in after quarantine. And we started looking at his vertical jump and tracking not only um, subjective, like looking at the counter movement itself, but also the height and then his RSI using a, like just a simple jump mat for jump versus vertical jump um, and kind of measuring that as a, as a proxy for his ability to store and release elastic energy. And then for the other person, um, for me, it's going to be more of, Again, motor skill, so, so watching them cut, videoing them cut, can they demonstrate for me quality mechanics of a model cut, right? When he hits the ground, I wanna see enough ankle, knee, and dorsiflexion, uh, ankle, knee, and hip flexion to be able to lower that center of mass, but then I wanna see them create enough stiffness at the appropriate time. So, you know, we need a certain amount of trunk stiffness at the right time, otherwise we're gonna get shoulder sway and shoulder dump and all sorts of compensatory strategies up top because our guts are literally, and our momentum is literally knocking us over sideways, which again, changes your force application angle. So I want to see them hit the ground and not have their trunk continue to go in the direction of travel. I want to see their plant foot outside of their base of support in this sweet spot. So this is kind of in the, the linear acceleration literature right now. It's not really in the change of direction literature I've seen, but I think it's probably coming. So if you hit the ground too far behind your center of mass in sprinting, you don't get effective force application. If you hit the ground too far in front, you get too much breaking force, too much ground contact time, not effective force application. So there's like this, this U-shaped curve of where your foot should hit the ground. And so track coaches have forever have taught like down and back, under or behind the hips during linear acceleration to contact the ground, right? But if you hit too far behind, you over-rotate, you stumble, and your next contact pushes you straight up right? Which is not good either. And then you hit too far in front and you get all this breaking uh, force and you also get, you know, a negative outcome in terms of storage and release elastic energy. So the same thing applies to change direction. If your foot's too wide, that's going to be a stiff extended limb contact where you're not going to be able to propel out of it because you got no load, right? You need to load to explode. But if your foot contact is too far under your body, the rest of your body keeps going in that direction and you end up going straight up right? Because you don't have enough of a plant angle to direct your forces horizontally. So there, again, there's this sweet spot. So I want to see them hit that sweet spot, bend at the hip, knee, and ankle, create enough stiffness in the lower extremity to stop their descent, create enough stiffness at the right time in the trunk to stop their lateral momentum, and then redirect it out. And I want to see a straight line of force application as they tow off. So I want to see that force line going from uh, their heel or their, their ankle all the way up through their head as they're towing off the push out of the cut, just like I would want to see during a linear acceleration. So that's our subjective measure. And then objectively, we're looking at, again, if, if it's somebody who's of age and I'm working with them, I'll throw them on the gym wear and we'll do a load velocity profile. And I want to get a sense of how they produce force at different velocities. But I still think you can get a lot out of just jump profiling. So if you don't have a jump mat using like the My Jump 2 app can be an option. But like, I'll look at no counter movement, counter movement, and four jump. And I'll do that as well with like a single leg if there's an asymmetry I'm concerned about. Um, and then we'll utilize that as our tracking. So as somebody gets better from that force production standpoint, I would expect uh, the ability to load and explode effectively through an appropriate counter movement, right? Not too deep, not too shallow. I would expect RSI to improve because they're going to be able to store and release elastic energy quicker 
and, and they're able to apply force in a shorter ground contact. And then I would also expect their no counter movement jump to improve because now they're gonna have a thicker rubber band and greater force application capabilities and a greater ability to push up internally um, through their pelvic diaphragm and concentrically orient it to throw their guts up in the air. And so that's your more uh, low pressure, narrow, less force biased individual. And so you're tracking that the whole time. And, and some of those measures will track, you know, once a week or every session, if it's a squat and I really care about the squat, I'll have them do a squat after their activities every time and just see where we're at. If it's a four jump versus a vert or something that's a little bit more subjective in terms of change of direction, we'll do that a little bit less frequently, probably once a month or every three weeks, depending on the, the length of the time they're with me. And a lot of really good points there. I think <laughs> one of the ones you really hit the nail on the head with was just timing in general is just huge. And like, if you don't get that good foot contact to start, the timing of everything else gets thrown off and the way you direct forces is not going to be as efficient toward where you want to go. 100%. And, and that's, I think, I think rhythm and timing are things that are underappreciated because we don't have as good a way to measure them. Right. But there is a certain rhythm to a linear sprint. Um, Altus talks about it all the time, right? Like uh, projection rhythm and rise of their tenants. And that's, that's been important to me uh, to learn more about that. But if you watch a full speed sprint, like I still watch everything in slow motion, but if you watch a full speed sprint, you can get a sense of the rhythm of the sprint. Like it should be smooth. It should grow with each step in velocity. Ground contact time should shorten, <laughs> center of mass should rise gradually. And if you don't see that, a lot of times it can, it can violate your eye if you've watched enough sprinting where like you say like, I can't quite pinpoint exactly what was wrong with that, but I know there was something off with the rhythm. And then you watch and it's like, oh, right here, you flat tired on step four and your whole foot hit the ground with a vertical shin and you pop straight up. And that was a long ground contact time. And again, when I watched it at full speed, it just looked jumpy right at that midpoint. Um, and so that like rhythm and timing is really important. And then in the change of direction context, again, it's like we talk about stiffness as if it's a bad thing a lot of times, right? And, and I will admit that I'm biased towards that because I tend to work with a lot of athletes and myself who are stiffer, right? I come from a football background and the culture of football is lift heavy all the time from a young age. Um, I even have two football players right now. They're in high school. They're sophomores. And they're so stiff and so robotic. And, you know, I'm asking them, they come in, they're like rubbing everything and they're like, back my knee i'm like what's going on with you guys like are you guys okay and they're like oh we you know we maxed out on deadlift an hour ago i was like what <laughs> like they're they're going with their team and they're maxing out squats and deadlifts and i mean i'm not even joking these kids can't do a body weight squat or an offset reaching plate squat to save their lives and they're telling me they're squatting 365 pounds on a barbell back squat and so i'm like okay like you know so that that biases me a little bit away from this stiffness end of things but it is really important to have the appropriate timing of stiffness, right? If you can't ramp up stiffness at the right time in your cut or, or in your plyo or in your sprint, then you just continue moving into the ground. And again, you don't get this appropriate or this optimal storage and release of elastic energy. So when you hit the ground, it's about being able to um, expand and relax and position your body and express velocity at the appropriate time. And then when it's time to stop and reaccelerate, it's about optimizing stiffness to make sure that you don't get more deformation than is necessary or than is optimal. And so you need this element of uh, movement and velocity and, and uh, expansion, and then you need compression and stiffness and the ability to stop very abruptly. Um, and that's why I look at change of direction as a skill, right? It's like, once you have those capabilities, the, the orientation of force application, the timing, the, uh, the velocity going into the cut, the position of the body to optimize those mechanics, it's skill. And, and it's something that we got to develop, you know, in our athletes in order to, to optimize it across these multi-directional speed elements. That's, that's huge. Cause it's like, if you understand that you need going into a cut to create that expansion and then to come out of the cut, you need to create that compression force into the ground and understand just conceptually what a cut should look like these things are going to happen, like you've been saying, regardless of, of where they can get it, just a matter of where they're getting it from. Yeah. And so you have this kind of picture of what an optimal cut looks like, and it doesn't look like that in deviates. And it's just a matter of, oh, well, where are they getting their delay or yielding strategy? Where are they pushing into the ground from? Then it's just like, let's just, let's just flip the switch and give them things to make it more optimal. 
it yeah. makes your your exercise selection and your decision making a lot easier. Hundred percent, and that's that's been probably the biggest change in my understanding and my model over the last year or two. Right, uh, part of it is again like Bill has been incredibly helpful in providing this model to then say like, oh my gosh, like this is the same thing, right? Like walking is cutting, and, and like understanding how gait and and movement occur. And then saying like, it's not different, right? I still need to appreciate where these expansion and compressive strategies have to occur makes it so much easier to see. But on top of that, it's also just reps, right? And that's why I think Bill, people like Bill and Lee are just so brilliant because they've been doing it and Rufus as well, just been doing it so long. It's like you have this robust model in your head from seeing so many reps. And, you know, Dan Paff is another one. Like people will say like, you can just, he can watch something and it's not in slow-mo and he just sees it right because his model is so robust for from what he's seen over time that it kind of breaks his model just enough to grab his attention he's like that's the thing that looked off there that i i just know that that's the thing that was off um and i think this was from um what book was this on intelligence uh, was a big influence on me right and, and having this this memory prediction model developed from experience right and from memory and from the storage of memory and then how your brain processes that information that's in front of you. It's all about creating this predictive model based on what you've experienced before. And then when something violates your predictive model, it grabs your attention. It makes it more cortical. It makes it more forebrain. And so that's been very helpful for me. It's like, I have my technical model of linear acceleration. I have my technical model of change of direction. And I have the, the model that Bill has outlined and, and helped provide for so many people. And it's like, when something deviates from that, I can see that and figure out, okay, what is it that I need to do to intervene? And that makes your exercise selection very targeted, very individualized. Um, and then you just, again, you reassess based on that technical model or whatever KPIs you're tracking and you figure out, okay, we, maybe we clean that up. That looks really good. Now what's the next thing that we can optimize? Um, I think the, the guys that train adapt evolve like uh, Patrick Estes and Aaron Davis, they'll say, you know, periodization is a great concept, but their model of periodization is what is the limiter? train that limiter, reassess that limiter, train, train it again, right? Train the next one, whatever it is that you've changed. And I think that's where we can get into a, a realm where training is much more targeted to what the person needs so that we don't have to just hammer the same elements over and over again with somebody when they don't need it. Yeah. And then the other piece of that is you're never going to have all the answers and Rufus, feel free to chime in here. So a lot of those reps and experiences, just recognizing what you see and just having seen so many athletes do it, you kind of just know where to go intuitively because, oh, I have an athlete that's this, this type of person, this strategy. I mean, I know exactly what's going on and what I'm seeing, but I know I need to go here just because I've seen it 10, 20,000 times over and over again. Yeah, I think that's, that, that's really important, you know, and, and the thing that most people don't do is add in that component of seeing how they move. You know, we see, you know, we may see the squat. Okay. But you know, how's he getting there? How's, how's, how's he moving through these other phases? It was like Corey and I were watching a game of tag the other day, you know, and it was, you know, and he's, we're going through, you know, you know, this kid's not doing this, this kid's not doing that and a whole different thing, just like you were saying. And, and I don't think enough, I don't think enough people, look at it from that standpoint, we, we look at a number and I'm trying to get away from the number to, because you can't tell me a number, how much I got to squat to be a great player. Right. Yep. And so, um, it, you know, it's, it becomes, Oh, how does he move that number? You know, or how fast does he move that number? You know, how's it look? And, yep. and even that's changeable, I think from day to day. You know, what, you know, uh, Corey didn't get any sleep the night before and his movement was terrible yesterday, you know? And, and so, but other days when he gets enough sleep, the movement's really, really good, you know? Yeah. And I was, we, we, we train this, we, Corey's helped me train this kid uh, that's going to be a freshman in college, he's going to play football and all the things you talked about Corey's done with him where he changed him, you know, to now where he looks, the model is 
pretty good when he's doing all these different movements, when he's cutting, changing direction, loading, unloading, things like that. Yeah, and it's – I think – you bring up a really interesting point, which is that you have to get to know your athletes too, right? You mentioned kind of maybe he gets bad sleep one night or he doesn't sleep or, you know, he has a fight with his girlfriend or, you know, he doesn't eat well that day, whatever it is, you can't appreciate that unless you've watched them over time and started to like track something, right? Even watching them move is a, a form of tracking. And so it's like, can I get a sense of, how this person tends to move when I see them and what is an off day versus a, a, you know, a good day. And then that just opens a conversation. It's like, you know, what'd you do last night? You know, how'd you sleep? How'd you feel? And you can see this walking in the door too. Sometimes, you know, I got one kid who just comes in and, you know, everybody knows he's there on a regular basis when he comes in. It's like, we, we know that guy's coming today. Uh, but one day he came in and was like a mouse, right? He had n- nothing to say, dead quiet. Even one of the PTs who's never even talked to him directly before was like, hey, is he okay? And I'm like, I'm not really sure. So I started asking some questions and, you know, he was just tired and smoked from a weekend of a lot of games. But it's like, once you know your athlete, you can figure out like what's going on. And then are we you know, tracking something that demonstrates us progress over time and also tracking something that demonstrates for us when somebody's really ready to train that day? Or maybe when we have to kind of you know default to something else, maybe that's not the day to train high level coordination and, and high velocity yeah. force output. Uh, maybe that's the day where we work on you know movement, aerobic quality, some something else, kind of take it off and we train another element that needs to be trained, uh, yeah. which is important for in season too, because you got to really track fatigue at that point and figure out when it's time to you know push the gas a little and when it's time to pull back and break. Yeah, I think that you know so many people. I used to do this, you know. The, workouts written in stone you know you got to do 90 percent back squat today and we don't care how you feel just get your ass down and do it (laughs) oh yeah yeah you know i mean that's a football mentality right oh yeah Yeah. (coughs) i have a a hard enough time telling myself not or telling myself not to do that even up until a year ago which is why yeah my programming now it's like well i had this on the template today i feel awful but you know what? Like the hell with it. I'm just being soft. Like I'm gonna, I'm gonna go lift that. And, yeah, uh, you know, I was, I was the same way. And you know, it just, just come in here and do this. Oh, yeah. You know, you got to get over it. You got to be a little tough. Yep. And, and, uh, and then you just start to realize, like over time, you can accumulate more high quality work by appreciating that maybe today, you know, we're just gonna we're gonna work on something else, and we'll come back after it the next day, right? We're gonna eat a little better, sleep a little better. We'll, we'll see how we're feeling. Um, but it becomes the long game. You know what I mean? It's like, if you're patient and you have the long game in mind, then, then things tend to work a lot better. Um, because there have been a lot of situations where, you know, myself as the example, like I've kind of run myself into the ground and I've thought, you know what, like nothing bad's going to happen. I just need to, I just need to man up and go do this. And then something bad does happen. And that sets you out for, you know, four weeks, six weeks, whatever it is. And you're like, "Eh, was that really worth it? And it wasn't. So it's, I think that's an important element of it. And then even at the intensive, I remember watching you coach some of the athletes through like the Olympic lifts and, uh, and just seeing like the, the eye for movement from getting so many reps of watching that movement and coaching that movement over the years. And so one thing that I've tried to do in the last year, um, and I've had a couple of athletes that have helped me with this, that I'm friends with is just watching more film, like watching more film of not only them in the weight room and them training, but like sports in general, like learning their position learning how that position like the demands that are specific to the multi-directional speed elements of that position and then watching film of them right and getting a sense of how they move on the field and how that correlates and, and what i can do to help them and that just gives you more reps and more of a robust technical model that i think is, is so important that's that's why you used to tell the kids all the time you know like, if you want to go by you know the guy said you got to have who was it, erickson or somebody said that you have to have 10,000 reps to perfect something. Yep. Well, he doesn't say what kind of reps those are, right? It could be a 20 kilo <laughs> bar. It could be, you know, in your head, you know, and, and, and different things, or it could be with weight, you know, it just says 10,000 reps. Okay. Yeah. You know, we can, we can do it a different, a lot of different ways. And, and I really like you, you mentioned like the, the, the weight and the quality of the movement with weight. Right. And I love Ty's kind of take on that where he's like, you know, 
once somebody has the ability to express these positions, right? We talk about position being important and achieving a certain quality of movement to meet a technical standard. It's like, can you do that under increasing load? And what is the threshold at which you can maintain that movement under some sort of external load, whatever that external load is. So if we're talking squat, it's like, awesome. It's cool that we've got your squat improved, but now like, do you fall apart the minute we put a bar or a weight in your hand, or can you resist that load and maintain your movement quality under that load? And that makes a more robust pattern, right? That you can then transfer potentially to higher intensity activities that has more relevance to sport performance. And so for me, it's like uh, weight room stuff, those patterns are, are you able to maintain that pattern of movement under some sort of external load and perturbation? And the moment that breaks down, that's where we're going to work, right? It's like, that's, that's where we're going to build a more robust system. And so I think instead of chasing weight, it's let's get load on there or velocity or tempo or time under tension or whatever it is that we want to utilize to overload the system. See if you can maintain the quality of movement under more um, intense circumstances, under more intense perturbation. Um, and so that's kind of how I've changed looking at movement. And so the movement quality there becomes huge as right. well as yeah. the velocity and things like that. I think it's the same thing with your tag. I, I really like the earlier on the description that you did. And I know Ty does this, um, Ty, Ty Terrell. And, uh, um, you know, he'll, he'll demonstrate or the practice on just the movement. And then he turns them loose. We go play tag, right? Yeah. Okay, then we go back and work on it again. Then we go back and play tag some more. Yep. You know, I, I think, um, uh, you know, I, I have kids go out and chase rabbits or their dogs all the time when they haven't got somebody to play tag with. Seriously, right? I love that. And so last year during quarantine, this kid that we trained, um, Luke, and then, you know, I trained by himself, so I don't have any competition, right? So... I said, get the dog out. The dog ran him ragged. Oh, yeah. And I found out that he's got no idea what a pursuit angle is. So he, I, I would watch him on his, on his uh, uh, we call it, thing, uh, phone. Yeah. You know? And so he'd go out in the backyard and he had his dog. That, and the dog used to, uh, got to where he loved doing this, right? Yeah, of course. <laughs> so I just chase him for about 10 or 15 seconds and give him a rest and we'll go again, right? And, uh, um, and it was funny because the thing I the thing I didn't know was that he chases. Well, if I watch a game film, he's chasing everybody. That's awesome, right? So I said, you know, do you ever think about cutting the dog off? Yeah. <laughs> you know, so so you're not chasing him all over the yard. Yep. Well, well, I didn't know that. Well, yeah. <laughs> so so we, we do that, and then this year watching his game film he tried to cut more people off instead of chasing all the time that is awesome it is so funny you mentioned that too because i think quarantine opened a lot of people's eyes to like things that either we've never thought about or forgotten about from a training perspective because no one had access to a gym and to other people so i my my friend who's also a linebacker who's you know working on getting back into the league he was over my house pretty much every day during quarantine doing like training we were outside we were on my porch we were going to the hill in the school nearby but we both had dogs and so the little guy who busted into the room a little while ago we would let them out and we'd let them chase each other and then with when they were with each other they don't listen to anybody right when they're when they're alone like they're a little bit better but when they're with each other there's you know they don't care about what we say so we would be like all right we have to go train now we got to get the dogs back in the house and they're not having any other so we would try chasing them around the yard. Now I don't have any fences or anything. So the only constraint is kind of the street. And he has, he knows like, I don't go out the street, but like, there's a lot of yard to cover and there's no chance. Like if that dog does not want you to catch him, you are not catching him at all. So we're chasing around the front yard. I'll never forget. I'm trying to chase after Drago, my dog. And I see my buddy come flying out of the corner of my eye and cut off his dog and ear hole him as if he's tackling in the open field and really? just takes out his dog. And I'm like, oh, okay, that's why he gets paid to do that. Like, you can figure that out pretty quickly. But, you know, we were joking. We we're like, yeah, if you had a chicken or some sort of animal with like a fenced in area and you chased it around, you probably get some pretty valuable things out of that change of direction experience. 
And then, and then, you know, the concept of taking that open drill and saying, okay, you just exposed your potential limiter or a movement fault or something. Now I have an assessment to pull you out of that, do my change of direction drill and put you back in that open context. I mean, Lee is, Lee Taff has been talking about that forever. And I took that from him and, and Ty and that's been so valuable to me. I love pairing exercises where the, the activity that I'm utilizing addresses a specific fault in the reactive open skill. And then we put them back into it and we see if they can apply it. And then we use that again as our test retest model. Um, and so the kids love it. It gets them doing a lot of, you know, interactive games and chase games and sprinting and change of direction. But then we also get the skill acquisition work when we find some sort of inefficiency in their movement or in their strategy. There, there's a great article that's on ESPN somewhere. And it was written, I don't know, 10 years ago, but there's a place in Florida um, down, down in the Everglades. And where all these great pro football players come from. And so this, this, the, whoever wrote the, the article went down to figure out how come all these great football players come from there. And, and uh, uh, you know, they talked to Bobby Bowden, Bobby Bowden says, Oh, it's the black dirt down there, you know, and, and, and all the, all these different things. Right. Yep. But there's one thing that happens every year. And that is the, and there's a lot of sugar cane fields down there. And the, the average home income is like $24,000. So they don't have money to go, you know, pay you to train them, right? Teach them how to do all this stuff. So anyhow, they, they, call, they call it the chase. And they burn the sugar cane fields. And all the men go out and they chase the rabbits coming out of the sugar cane fields. That's where I got the idea. Uh, and so, awesome. So they chase these rabbits, right? And there's th there's three reasons to catch the rabbit. One, so you have a little, you know, you can sell the pelt. I think at that time it was like five bucks and have a little extra spending money, okay? Two, it's fun. And three, if you don't catch a rabbit, you and your family go hungry that night. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> That'll make you get it real fast, huh? Oh, yeah. And, and so they... All, all these great running backs and defensive players um, uh, come from this, this, this area. It's called Bell, I, the high school, I think is Bell Glades. And, uh, um, uh, and they, and so they, 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 they chase this rabbit. And I'm thinking to myself, well, that's just backyard training. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so, that's how it is. You know, so go chase a rabbit or go chase your dog. If you can't find a rabbit. Yep. So over the years, I've had all these kids out chasing their dogs or chasing the rabbits. You know, we, we I was I was working at one place one time, and it was next to a cornfield, right? And every once in a while, you'd see a bunch of cars stopped along the side of the road because they'd seen a rabbit and they jumped out of the car trying to catch him. You just got people lining up going and yeah, like, yeah, rabbit down the line. Yeah, yeah. No, so, it's, it, it's crazy to me that there's a kind of the debate in what we do about like open versus closed agility or open, you know, agility versus closed change of direction work. And it's really? like, there's room for both. You know what I mean? It's, 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 yeah, sure. There's, there's more transfer of a true agility skills because that's the way that sport is played. But we know that we can isolate certain elements of change of direction and linear speed and make athletes more efficient and effective at them. And, and I right. think it's more of like, instead of taking, the first progression. So everybody, you know, starts their linear sprinting progression with a wall drill and then a skip and then a march. And then, you know, we go through this kind of progression. I think it's like, let's put athletes in positions to accelerate, show me how you accelerate. And then let's use that as our metric of saying, you know what, here's where we can make you more effective. And here is what is, what is needed to allow you to do this better. Because a lot of times you drop a ball in front of an athlete and all of a sudden they show you a really good acceleration angle. Right. They show you certain elements that are already there and intrinsic to the nervous system. And it's just about saying, OK, you know, maybe you don't use your arms very effectively. Maybe you don't understand the concept of striking back and you stumble. Maybe it is a force application issue and you're just not strong enough relative to your, you know, your own body weight to handle that in such a short ground context. we got to get you stronger. Um, and, and again, maybe it's skill. Like I'm a big believer in, in kind of a track and field mentality of developing linear acceleration as a skill to a degree. Um, and then same thing with change of direction. It's like, 
you know, it looks like gym class, as we said earlier, but, you know, let's have kids play tag. Let's have them play last man standing, chase each other, um, do elements like that. And then say, okay, like this person keeps getting caught because they're not particularly good at getting out of their cuts. Right. Or they're you know not particularly good at shuffling and actually being on a cover ground or they're, you know, unable to achieve a good lateral run position, whatever it is, or they don't have the force production. I remember one girl specifically, uh, we were working with like a group oriented speed and agility class at one of our locations that I was coaching. And it was like 45 minutes of like just pure speed and agility work. Uh, but it was, you know, a lot of games and then a lot of like, okay, we're going to address this specific element and back to games and things like that. And this one young girl, um, every time she would sprint, she would literally look like she's about to fall on her face. She would actually stumble like every time. And you would coach her like, Hey, like, you know, don't stumble. Just go ahead and run this next one. And she would literally stumble again. Like she couldn't not. And then you would watch her change directions. And she was like molasses getting in and out, out of her cuts. And all the other kids that were about her age were, you know, catching her every time. And she was just one of those people who was not, um, you know, she wasn't athletically lit, gifted at a young age to be able to manage her own structure and her own biases to be able to push up against gravity. She's kind of one of those people getting shoved in the ground all day, every day. Um, and so for her, getting a little bit stronger, right? Building the ability to actually manage those forces would probably be incredibly powerful for her as an athlete in development. Because again, she wanted to be like a high level tennis player at 10 years old. It was already early specialization kind of thing, no, no gym. But it's like, you know, let's, let's get that person stronger, develop more force production, teach her a more sustainable force application strategy so she doesn't tear up her knees um, every time she goes to change directions or jump uh, because she was, you know, demonstrating that kind of distal compressive strategy, right? Like a lot of valgus to try to, you know, bring her pelvic floor back up and, and throw her, uh, throw her guts back up. And so, you know, that's something that we worked on with her a lot. And she, she saw a lot of improvement, even though she came to us for speed and agility, it was like, you know, I know you want speed and agility, but if you want speed and agility, you got to get stronger, right? We got to, we got to develop some strength and some, some actually uh, motor skill within the relevant uh, force production strategy you need to not constantly be getting buried into the ground all the time. So I think it's both, right? It's like open and closed drills, strength training, capacity work. It all has relevance to, to speed yeah. agility and sport performance. It's just, yeah. what does this person need and in what context? Yeah, but we focus so much on the strength aspect of it. I mean, as far as lifting weights, that I think we miss, you know, what do they do with a fat kid that's a football player? They make him an offensive lineman. He's not real athletic. They make him an offensive lineman, and they put him in the weight room to make him stronger, and all he does is get bigger, fatter, and slower. <laughs> you know, he gets fatter ankles. You don't have to talk about me like that, Rufus. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, that that's, me. that's what they do. They're, they're, they're already strong because they, they got to carry that big freaking load around yep. all the time, right? Well, yeah. now, now I got to get him strong in, in like I call it, the right areas. Yeah. You know, you got, he's got to be able to move. You know, and it's, it's like a big elephant. I, you know, I got a kid now that's like a big elephant when he moves around. But he's a whole lot better than when I got him six months ago. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's important, too. And I think we often think of strength, right? We say that word and everyone thinks like weight, barbell, heavy, right? And it's yep. like, well, strength, and I even like the NSCA's definition of it, the most recent one that I'm aware of, is like, it's force at a given velocity, right? That's strength. And so it's, you know, can you move through space, through the excursion necessary that you need for whatever it is you want to do at the specific velocity you need to? And can you apply force to the ground in the appropriate orientation at the right speed and through the, the excursion you need? And, and that to me is strength. So, you know, you look at Usain Bolt or you look at Steph Curry, or you look at somebody who may not traditionally be weight room strong, I would define them as incredibly strong, right? Kyrie Irving, same thing. I was watching the, the Nets game last night and just watching him cut as quickly and, and abruptly as he does. You know, that's a tremendous amount of force to decelerate and reaccelerate the way he does. They're, they're strong imagine. enough to do the things they can do. Exactly. They're and that's what they need to do, right? And so yeah. that's not necessarily a 600-pound squat like, like you were talking about earlier. What's cool, though, is if you take that person who's got that elastic bias, though, so you'll still get those guys who are, like, really bouncy, right? And they have tremendous force in, like, a very short contact window. But through a fuller excursion, a longer contact time and under load, they don't have particularly good force production. If you give them that, 
not only do you make them mo more robust, more resilient, but you also thicken that rubber band enough where maybe now you get the, you get greater power outputs. So that's really cool. And I, I you know, that's where sometimes I think we get stuck in the, the idea that like, okay, we don't really need a lot of traditional strength. And sometimes we don't, but for that person, a little bit of that goes a long way and becomes super valuable to their overall longevity and performance. Right. Yep. strength is always contextual it's never it's never one thing so exactly. that gets missed a lot that's, a, that's sure. like the uh, russian weightlifters you know talk to talk to alexa i've never squatted more than 280 kilo and you know his, his point was why do i need to i only have to i can only clean and jerk 250 you know yep. um, yuri, yuri vandanian told me the same thing you know, he says, I, I, I could, I could never front squat more than I can clean and jerk. Well, that's all I needed. That's, yeah, all I needed. that's, that's, really, that's what and, you need, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I think, you know, even in weightlifting, I think we spend too much time trying to develop the squat and not enough time trying to develop the, the technique of the list itself. And that's another discussion. I'm I, sorry about that. No, no, I, I agree with you 100% and in the context of what we've been talking about. That's why I look at it as, as a skill, right? Linear sprinting, multi-directional speed. That's why we rep those things on a regular basis as a skill. Because to me, it's like you can have the force application, the position, all of that. But if you don't have the technical elements to deal with mass and momentum, to impart force appropriately, uh, that was another big thing for, for this year for me was just reading more and more research on change of direction. And, and it's been out there forever. But it's like orientation of force application comes up every single paper without fail. It's like if you're not directing your braking and propulsive forces horizontally, you're not going to change directions optimally, right? Or as fast as somebody else. And so that to me is, is skill acquisition. That's position. That's understanding plant angles, appropriately timed stiffness, changing levels. That's everything. But you can't do that in the weight room, right? Because you're not going to get that orientation of force application and it's not going to be contextual. And yeah. so for me, that's, that's a big element with change of direction. It's like, we got to, we got to develop these specific skills because if you ever do enough of this on your own, you will find out that one skill feels very different than another. And you may be great at one, but you may not be like a fish out of water in another entirely. So you got to figure yeah. out what this person needs for their sport, for their position, and then figure out what's relevant and develop that over time. Good. Well, um, Corey, you got, you, got, you got anything else? We better let him go. You know, his, his, his girlfriend yeah. there. His girlfriend there. dog looking lost back there. We got, <laughs> she's on the phone and folding clothes. He's like, what's he doing over here? <laughs> <laughs> Look at the dog. He's like, who's that? What kind of dog is that? Uh, he's actually a rescue. We don't know. He's like kind of a mutt. So he's uh, my girlfriend's a PT, but, and yeah. she was treating somebody who brought a, a dog home from Portugal. They found a stray in Portugal, and apparently that's not like a thing in Portugal. Everybody's got their own dog. They did the paperwork to bring it home, and they brought it home and found out it was pregnant. So it had a litter of puppies. She was treating them, and at the time she was like, "I want a dog." So he's like, yeah, listen, we have a litter of puppies. We can't take care of it. Like, we'll give it to you for free. Yeah. So we got him when he was about six weeks old. And he's some sort of like Portuguese hound mix. Um, but yeah, he's, he's pretty unique when it comes to the color and everything. Everybody sees him. They're like, what kind of dog is that? Uh, dog. Oh, yeah, he's, he's the best. I want to thank you for coming on and, uh, and uh, um, uh, talking with us. Spend some time. Of course. With yeah, that was a lot of fun. Yeah, no, this is this was awesome, guys. I, I really enjoyed this, and I really appreciate you guys having me on and uh, catching up with you and and uh, talking to Rufus again for the first time in a while. Like, I love what you guys are doing, and uh, it's a real honor to be on here. I, I, I feel like uh, we need to do a part two at some point. Hey, I'm always oh, yeah. I'm always down. You let me know. I'd love to come back and talk to you guys again. I think, I think we just scratched the surface. <laughs> <laughs> so many other directions we can go, right? Yeah, oh, man. yeah, exactly. Um, Elite, yeah. Uh, T-shirts, Rufus. Yeah, no, I was just going to do that. Hang on just one second. Um, yeah, of course. Uh, Justin. So every guest that comes on gets a free Smoothies with Rufus T-shirt.